industry, which is a, which is an industry that you play in, um, this pandemic has hit some more than it has hit others. So how has this pandemic affected the creative industry? You know, the pandemic has really messed up a lot of stuff, but I don't think so, actually. I see it a different way. I think now, you know, every industry still has to, you know, obey the basic laws of economics about demand and supply, right? And the ind an industry never, ever crashes until mm -hmm. the demand disappears. Do you understand? Or the suppliers are unable to supply. Those are the only two times you have issues. Or, you know, even when, there's distrib when you have distribution issues, as long as there's demand and there's supply, they'll figure out the distribution issues, right? So now things have changed. So I think that is, that is going to reflect on how people continue to, you know, interact with film. So I feel that we're going through a period of transition where mm -hmm. things might look like they've slowed down, but it's slowing down so that we, it can be built up again. You understand? It's slowed down to build the demand so that when this whole thing has been, uh, when this whole period is passed, we have a higher demand and we have to step up our supply. When your um, movie came out, I was really excited on Netflix. I was anticipating um, its release. But before it came out, I moved from watching um, new content to now watching the classics. So I watched uh, Mr. and Mrs. I watched... <laughs> I, I remember starting in Sakaba and stopping. So do you think this <laughs> pandemic would bring about um, a, a revamp of um, the classics? I, I don't think... It has anything to do with the with the pandemic, actually. I think that um, it's it's already happening, right? There was a okay. film last year um, with you know the one with Desmond, um, sorry, the one with um, Ram Sinwar. Do you understand? Yes, it yes. was living in bondage. Living in bondage. You know, it was yeah. That that was that was a nice film. I enjoyed it, and it's a, it's a, you know it's a remake of of a classic. So I think that. Um, I don't think the pandemic has anything to do with it. People have been trying to remake classics. People have been, um, you know, acquiring books that they want to make. So it's. I think it's going to continue. I don't think the pandemic has anything to do with it. But I think, uh, I think we're going to see some of the classics. There are some that we were supposed to start shooting just before the pandemic, and once it ends, we're going to get on those projects. You know, so it's, it's on. Do you want to? Do you want to fill us in on some of those um, movies, those classics that you, you're working on? <laughs> no, <laughs> not yet. When the time comes. Because I liked how you sneaked it in there and you thought I didn't hear it and you just <laughs> were trying to move on. <laughs> I like it. Um, that you, you do not necessarily see a rush for stories around the pandemic. So um, let's talk about the now. So um, there's been a halts in production and i've seen a few few um production houses cre still create in this time but then there's they are embracing monologues and try to infuse it there's a particular tv show that um has a new format like that and it's really brilliant and beautiful so do you think um right now because the creative industry is still one of those industries that is um on lockdown do you think that's the new future of um, work because a lot of industries are embracing new work tools. You see them embracing Zoom, Teams, and all of that. But for the creative industry that is people-based, how do you tell more stories and more and still keep your audiences engaged? I think if we look at it in terms of constants and variables, right? The constant is, for now at least, there is a, a lockdown. I don't think we, we're on this partial lockdown for a long time. Stories will still be told. We will, of course, have to adapt to the reality of the moment. Um, I think that people are just going to find clever ways to tell stories. There will be films that cannot be made at this point. It would be hard to make another Avengers with a partial lockdown. That would be really hard. But there are smaller stories that can be told. What I think will happen is we will have to learn to... Even post-pandemic, we will have to learn to tell better stories with less. But those mm. kinds of films require a higher level of artistry. You know, you don't have the usual distractions. You can't say, oh, this is a big, 
Nigerian A lister and just put them there and your dialogue is whack. You can't. You know, you really need to now become artistic to tell stories. But stories can still be told. So I um oh there's a pandemic. So the story doesn't make sense. The you know, the picture is bad, the sound is bad, so I'm gonna take it. No, people still have high standards. Uh, we're in a place where now more than ever we need to we will need to really, really know what we're doing as an industry. People um people in the creative industry are people who always claim to be working. Oh, I'm busy. I'm getting stuff done. I'm getting this done. <laughs> so have you coped? Have you yes. coped with this period where you're just home? Because I believe uh, I, we were engaged last year um, for a particular thing. It's <laughs> yes. so difficult to get a hold of. Have you reworked your schedule to um, adjust with the time? My day every day ends around nine. Okay. And a, l a number of times, I still don't get to finish everything I planned for the day. Do you understand? So one of the things that people don't misunderstand about film is they think you're working when you're on set. I say to people that when I'm on set, it's like I'm on a holiday. That's the easiest part. <laughs> you know, the hardest part is what happens before. And I think there's a good thing that's coming out of that. Because one of the issues we've had as an industry is mm. the lack of pre-production. Do you understand? We don't, you know. So now, for we have the time to do it properly. Nobody can, you know, for the films that are supposed to be made in um, maybe in around May, and now they've been moved, now you have the time to prepare properly. And I hope all my colleagues are doing that. You know, now you have the time. You don't have an excuse. Everybody's at home. Call your DP. Call your audio cast, do your rehearsals. This is the time. So I've not had as much time alone as I would like, actually. It would have been <laughs> nice if this was just one long holiday, but fortunately it hasn't been. But then how has this affected investors for movies? You said now you're getting a lot of briefs, but um, I read a particular report and the report stated that a lot of spend, there's a projection that a lot of spend will move to online. Do you think this pandemic would affect how investors um, direct monies towards the creative industry. Do you mean um, post-pandemic or right now? No, now and post-pandemic. Okay, right now, of, of course. I mean, a lot of people are slowing down when it comes to investment um, because they're asking, um, you, you know, when you invest money in film, you've got to figure out how you make your money back. It's a business, right? And people are asking if we can't go to, if people can't go to the cinemas, that means we only have the online market. You understand what I'm saying? It has reduced the, the, the revenue stream. So, of course, certain people have cut back on their budgets, certain people are just holding on, and that is understandable. But mm -hmm. post pandemic, yes, uh, somebody reached out to me recently and they said, oh, I know that cinema is dead. And I'm like, who killed it? You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> so it's a it's a common I understand it but look at it this way it's like saying that people will no longer attend concerts because they bought your, your, your CDs or because they downloaded your songs on iTunes or whatever no that's not how it works people don't go to cinemas because they want to watch films because let's be real right most of the films that people watch in cinemas today, a lot of people have those films on their hard drives, pirated. Do you understand? So my mm. point is, it's not people don't go to the cinemas because they can't watch those films somewhere else, legally or illegally. That's the truth. That's the reality. People go to the cinemas for the experience. Now thinking about the future, so? um, do you think do you think people would? rush back into the uh, back to the cinema i don't because think so. let's say this pandemic ends and then cinemas are opened in the next four months so don't you think it would and producers people in the creative industry start churning out content don't you think it would still be unwise to create stuff for cinemas because you know that a lot of people would not rush into the cinemas to watch it because of the fear which will be with us for perhaps the next one year of plot yeah, I completely agree. 
right? Um, I don't think people are going to rush back to the cinemas. I think that's unrealistic, you know, and I, you know, it's just natural. You probably won't rush back to the cinemas. You're not rushing back even to, <laughs> to, to restaurants, <laughs> so, you know, but I think that phase is going to pass, you know, People will watch, and then if nothing bad happens, people are going to get bolder and bolder, and then ultimately, it's how it works. Now, do I think it's wise for producers to invest now in film? I think this is a good time, and this is why. If you're making a film now, let's say, like you said, the pandemic ends, maybe August, whatever, I don't know. If you're making a film this year, that film is not coming out this year. It's coming out next year. Mm, okay. Do you understand? So this is the time to make your film because by the time your film is ready, this thing would have ended. But if you're waiting until next year to make your film, then your film is going to come out. <laughs> Do you understand? It up a year. Remember, we have a backlog of films that haven't been released. Yes, and yeah, uh, uh, nice that you mentioned that backlog. Um, Ibuka had a conversation with Tony Abraham, whose movie was supposed to be in cinemas. If few weeks before the pandemic started yes, and then there were a lot yes, of movies yes. that were built to be out so do you think it's yes. wise for for them to stall or just put it on streaming platforms because there are lots of streaming platforms on the rise there are nigerian based streaming platforms that are doing well and then there are um platforms like netflix um which your um, movies on um do you think it, it would be wise yeah. to be smart for them to move those movies there when you make it film you project how much you're going to make back if you make it for financial reasons, right? You always say, what am I going to get back? The streaming platforms, we have an idea of how much you're going to pay. Do you understand? So if you do the math and you find out that, so if you invested, I don't know, 10 Naira in your film and you're going to make 5 Naira back from the streaming platform, maybe you should wait. Mm. If you, you know, if you can't take the loss, but if you can, then sure, why not? So it's really a financial decision to make. Do you understand? And people are going to make different decisions. Some people are going to put it out on streaming platforms. And there, like you said, there are a lot of them. And um, there are more coming up. And there are more avenues to make money now. And remember that um, cinemas have only been just one avenue to make money when it comes to film. Yeah. There's, there are a number of others. So... Because one door is closed doesn't mean you don't have the others open, you know. I like how you um, put numbers there, 10 naira, 5 naira. Are you willing to handle the loss and all of that? So do you think... Um, I had a conversation with someone and then it was a lot of arguments. Do you think Nigerian film producers are underselling their content on this streaming platform to get, to get visibility? But the truth is, there is no one answer. Mm. Everybody, so what are you two every product is different. No, personally, I think it's different per project. Do you mm. understand? So there are projects you make. And so if, for example, I make a film for using numbers again for 10 Naira and the streaming platform is giving me 20 Naira, 100%. But if I make a film for 50 Naira, and they're or maybe for one thousand naira and they want to give me ten naira i might feel bad about it do you mm. understand something we also should realize is a lot of times you argue only from our side it's understandable human beings are inherently selfish but let's also look at it on the part of the of the platforms you're entering a new market you can't the nigerian film industry is big mm -hmm. but it's not as big as hollywood mm. mm -hmm. do you understand so we have to realize that we need to make a financial case for our products on their side do you understand we need to justify why they should pay a whole lot of money and um i think they're paying they're stepping up now you know, they are stepping up now. You know, we need to make films that the world wants to see. And I think we're beginning to do that. You know, right now I see a lot of people who say, oh, I don't watch Nigerian films. And they say, oh, I've seen like, two films and I really like them. And that is good. 
the more we do that, it gets to a point where, you know, and we're going to get that very quickly. But I don't think the reaction is for us not to engage, to say streaming platforms should pay us. I, I think I would be very ignorant to say the streaming platform should pay me what they paid the what they paid Martin Scorsese for his new film. I mean, that's just silly. When people say they are being underpaid, mm. the question is what exactly we also need to be realistic about our value. Do you understand? So if you, there are, pit, there are rooms you enter and you say, this is my film. They say, we don't know you. You don't need to know me. This is my film. They watch the film then, and they're like, oh, see, boss. And then the conversation changes. As a matter of fact, they can mm -hmm. add two zeros to the negotiation on the spot. But just I like it. it. So let's just talk about my interaction and everyone's interaction with um, the delivery boy. It's um, been a day that it's been on Netflix. Um, congratulations um, on having the delivery boy on Netflix. So I have questions around the casting. I have questions about the languaging. I have questions about the twist at the end because I feel like the end was so brilliant. I did not <laughs> come in. So, but why now? Why now? The question is, why now? You said um, you created this movie 2015, 2016. But well, why the decision to yeah. share now? Because it's done well in cinemas and um, in festivals and a lot of my friends went out before I watched it yesterday. Was like, oh, um, that movie was really powerful. Um, he touched different themes and all of that. But why now? Why the decision to put it on this platform now? So, so for me, right? Um, I don't see film. So a lot of times, I, when I talk to some people, they see film as fast-moving consumer goods. You know, FMCGs mm -hmm. like. Um, you buy a sachet of pick milk, you use it, and it's done, right? I don't think so. I think film is more like real estate. Do you understand? But uh, you really need to understand the business of film to understand that part, you know? So there's, I've seen some people, there's a rush to exhaust the film now. And I'm like, well, if you don't have a, if you feel you don't have a certain kind of film, I can understand that, you know? But the delivery boy was not made for the moment. It was made to last for as long as it can last, you know, as long as the people can relate to it. So the plan originally, we didn't even plan to go to the cinemas. It was, there was a path that was built for the film. And I was stubborn and insistent on sticking to that path because there were benefits to that path that I saw. You understand, it played more to our long term, our long term strategy as a production company. Do you understand? So this is the point in time where the film would come out, you know. And but we didn't choose the dates actually. We interacted with Netflix, they liked the film, and they chose when they would release it and they chose now. But why did we wait this long? It was because it was ju it just wasn't the time based on our own plan. So Another question I want to ask about the movie is the choice of characters. I believe that um, Jamal Ibrahim and uh, Jemima Osunde, mm -hmm. thinking about it, they both have J's in their names. They were both fantastic and played <laughs> it so beautifully. So was that a deliberate, uh, were you, yeah. how deliberate were you about the casting? Because um, how deliberate were you about the casting? Um, the, I don't think there's any filmmaker who's not deliberate, as any director who's not deliberate about casting. You have to be. And not just about casting, but also how you you use the cast. Do you understand? So um, Jamal Ibrahim was, I mean, we did some casting. When I met him, we walked through the door. He had a cocky smile on his face. You know, he sat down. And before we even started the casting, I was like, yep, this is the guy. <laughs> you understand? Same with Jemima. I met Jemima on another set. I was shooting a film for Boss Elshin, brilliant producer. Uh, and it was a film directed by Tulu Ajayi, another brilliant director. And I was deep in on the film. And I do that a lot. When I'm deep in, I'm watching the actors. Because we have a lot of projects <laughs> coming up. So I'm always looking for good actors. So and the thing is, when people are not aware you're watching them, you see a lot of stuff. Yeah. And when you're behind the camera, oh my God, you can see so much. You can, I say you can see into people's souls. So... I was, um, okay, I've been trying to catch, uh,
uh, somebody to play in camp. Yeah. So I've been trying to cast someone to play in camp. That's um, Jemima's character. And it was very, very troublesome. I couldn't find the right person. And then I met Jemima. And we just, we were just talking while shooting. And I was like, at the end of the set, I just called Botsashi and I was like, I need that girl's number. She's in camp. Yeah, that was really how the casting was done. Um, and then there were also ways that I had to, for example, I insisted that Jamal, because we did some rehearsals, so. Were you deliberate about telling the story with that, with um, using that language? Um, you used um, the Hausa language in the movie. And then uh, I think last year, um, I deliberately chose the language because, yes, because uh, the conversation, of the conversation the last year, like the Oscars. Yes, the conversation last year was um, what that movie was about the language. It not having enough Nigerian um, traditional language um, in in the movie uh, to be considered. So, do you think um, that yeah. you ha did you have that information um, before creating the movie, and did that influence the language and in the film? So. This is the thing. Uh, I did not choose Alsa because of the Oscars, like or any awards. Um, I think it's disrespectful to film to to change a material because of some awards or because of some festivals. No, if you have a film, now that's not to say that you shouldn't keep that in mind when you're developing your strategy. Of course, you should. But if you don't have a film that does best in a native language, and then you want to force a native language on it just because you want, I think that's pretty silly. Do you understand? So for the delivery boy, it was, it was, that was the language. There was no other language. You understand that? That's just it. It had to be in that language. I, I really like staying true to. You know, especially when something is cultural, as much as possible. Do you understand? You have to stay true to the culture, in my opinion. And that's what, that's what really guided my decisions. You know, because if you want to make a film that's realistic, then you have to keep as much... It's already a film, which is not real. So you have to keep as much reality, reality in it for people to really, really get into the moment. Do you understand? That's a serious place to be as a filmmaker. And it's not a place you will always be. Do you understand? And also because... The, the, it was self-funded. So that means there was nobody telling me we have to do this, you know, so it allowed me to do what I felt should be done. Do you understand? So I literally just wrote the story and the story ended at that point. And mm -hmm. people said, oh, why not extend the story? And I'm like, the story is done. The story has ended. End of story. This is my money. This is, you understand? <laughs> so leave it alone. <laughs> uh, and I, I gambled on the fact that, see, if this story is well told and it's done, then it's done. I'm also the kind of person that I can write a story that's three hours long, as long as it's well told. Um, this has been fun. So Ulu Describe said, authenticity to the story and character not dictated by algorithms or trends and um, stumped by Sonny says yes, and that's what is Nollywood. That's what <laughs> Nollywood is all about. The culture. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cool, cool. And thanks everybody who joined in. <laughs>